أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمي For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري recite aloud صلوات على محمد وآل محمد My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the questions that are now being presented, the problems that we are facing at this exact moment, is a question pertaining to a new and emerging technology, referred to as artificial intelligence. And a lot of people are amazed by the capabilities of this new technology, what it can do. And without a doubt, this is considered a breakthrough and a culmination of the work of many scientists, engineers, mathematicians, coders, that has produced the result that we see today. And everyone acknowledges that it's only the beginning that this technology has the potential to completely overhaul the computing industry and what it is capable of doing. Many people are amazed and mesmerized by its ability to process vast amounts of information and produce human-like characteristics you're able to communicate with it, you're able to speak with it. Given the loneliness pandemic that's plaguing the world today, many people are turning to AI to make friendships, even develop intimate relationships with the large language model that comprises artificial intelligence. And so you interact with it as though it's a human being. You feed it information about yourself by asking questions, by providing it with details 
about your life and what you do, your routine, your work, your likes and dislikes. And the model is able to build on that in order to present itself as though it's just, it's just another human being. In fact, many of those resorting to AI to address their loneliness, they say that they're able to forge a bond with what is essentially computer code better than they can with actual human beings in their own lives. Not only this, but AI can give them what they're missing in terms of intimacy, in terms of attention. It's always available, it's always on. And so there are people today who have begun to forge an intimate relationship with an AI avatar or character or whatever you wish to call it, because it's not just the speech and the language, but also you can create avatars, you can have your ideal husband and your ideal wife, despite the fact that they are in intimate relationships. They're married, and yet it's almost like an open marriage where the husband or the wife, the partner, obviously has their flaws and has their pitfalls and has their issues. They're not always, they're not robots. And so one day they'll be happy and they'll be great listeners. The other day they'll be grumpy and not in the mood. Whereas with AI, you don't have any of those issues. Now the question I want to ask today is this, and it's a very relevant, very pertinent, very important question, which is, can AI replace a marja? Because these questions are being asked right now. Can AI replace your doctor? Can AI replace literally any of the professions that are critical for human infrastructure the way it is today to continue to function? Of course, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of fear. Will AI replace jobs and render people unemployed and therefore disrupt the fabric of society? cause all manner of problems while solving some, but you end up with jobs and professions that have become redundant thanks to AI. And of course, the idea that AI is only at its infancy at the moment only feeds the anxiety because what's going to happen in 10 years when the language model develops and the code is refined and the information that's ingested by AI becomes so advanced and so sophisticated that it'll be difficult to tell the difference between a human operator of, let's say, machines in a factory and an AI. And of course, like we said, there are things in artificial intelligence that can be uh, averted or completely eliminated when compared to human beings who might get tired and they have their biases and they have their um, mental and emotional challenges, right? AI, for instance, never experiences envy. Whereas we all know how it works in an office environment where there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of um, gossip, there's a lot of uh, backbiting and slander that takes place. And these are things that are generally considered unhealthy. Whereas with AI, you don't have to deal with any of those problems. It's just like the difference between using a computer to uh, type out your spreadsheets as opposed to giving it to a human being. And so the appeal is there. I'm sure you can imagine. And the appeal is amplified in an environment where there are those in the community who have traditionally followed a marja for decades, centuries, this classical model of a religious leader who has the expertise and the knowledge and the management skills to ensure the well-being of the community of believers. There are those out there, and I'm sure you've heard discussions like these by the water cooler or sometimes even in the mosque, 
Well, people say, you know, why do we even need maraja? At the end of the day, what a marja does is pretty simple. Some people think of ishtihad as a simple process. Uh, it might be rigorous and difficult and might take a long time, but again, we're dealing with human beings here. Whereas with artificial intelligence, you can alleviate all of these issues. You can ingest all the information, feed all the textbooks into it, teach it a few tricks on how to process the information. And after that, Bob's your uncle. The artificial intelligence model can basically give you the answer to your questions without having to deal with an actual person who comes with their flaws and shortcomings and so on, as we said. So once again, the question is, can AI replace a marja? But remember that when we say AI, really the question should be rephrased as, can anything replace a marja? Whether it's AI or robots in 3,000 years, right? Which by that time, they're probably ruling the world. And to be honest with you, I for one, would take a robot as a ruler over a human being any day of the week, right? Given all the oppression and persecution that we see coming from human beings. So I don't think they'd be worse than that. But so the question again is, give artificial intelligence, not just a few decades, in spite of the rapid development and advancement that we're seeing, but say a thousand years from now, can anything replace the traditional classical system of ishtihad and marja'iyah? That's the question. So keep that in mind as we continue our discussion. Now to understand or to find an answer to this question, really what you need to begin with is what is ishtihad? What is the role of a marja? before you're able to answer the question of, can something replace that? So I think this is, again, as I said, a very pertinent question. To respond to that, I think there's no doubt that AI, just like the computer and the calculator and any other tool has its benefits. And so it can be used to address certain problems and to fill in certain gaps where you're able to use this tool for research purposes or to engage with followers and believers uh, in a more efficient manner, right? Just like when the internet came along, you were then able to email the office of your marja as opposed to physically go and meet his representative or look up the answer to your question in the book of, uh, or the manual of religious laws, right? So it just became a little bit more efficient, a little faster, right? Uh, offices of the maraja have, uh, they're making use of these tools um, more and more. And so uh, you're finding that a question that used to be sent back in the day on horseback from country to country and would take months for the answer to come. And the maraja would oftentimes write an entire book in response to a question sent from a specific city or tribe or uh, town or village. And by the time the book reaches them, again, it's very inefficient, very difficult. But these tools have made it possible for us as a community of believers who uh, now find ourselves living in far-flung places to have greater access to the knowledge and the information. But the basic structure is the same. The basic structure is that you reach out to your marja. Now, how you reach the marja? How do you access the knowledge that the marja has? Might have changed, but it's still the same process. However, now we see people who are questioning the very basis of a marja. Or alternatively, if that strategy doesn't work in undermining the institution, the idea then becomes about how can we reform this system? And by reform, what they really mean is replace it with something else. And of course, many models have been presented, many ideas are floating around. 
but the structure needs to change. That's what their aim is, that's what the objective is. Going back to the question of what is ishtihad, in very simple terms, ishtihad comprises three main criteria. The first has to do with extensive research and study that allows the individual to understand and deduce and deduct the rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to obey and follow. But that's only part of the equation. In other words, all the years that a scholar spends within the Islamic seminary, learning from their teachers, teaching those sciences to their students and therefore sculpting their expertise, refining their knowledge, and subjecting it to scrutiny and peer review, the 20, 30, 40, 50 years that are spent doing that is only the first of a three-pronged process. You have to understand what God's rules are. And we have to keep emphasizing that these are God's rules, meaning that as Muslims, as believers, we surrender ourselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God tells us what to do. And because this process is a difficult one, and it was designed as such, the scholar has to spend many, many years and decades in order to reach this malakat, this expertise, this ability. Number one. Number two, they have to understand, the scholar has to spend a great deal of time and effort in understanding the mawadhi'ah. So the hukum is number one. The second is mawdu'ah. Hukum is the rule. Mawdu'ah is the subject matter of the rule. To illustrate, I'll give you a couple of examples. There was a lot of discussion a few years ago. I'm sure some of you who were involved in this would remember. Cryptocurrencies, right? Are they permissible? Are we allowed to trade in Bitcoin and other cryptos? So the question really, even though we're asking one question, but it's comprised of two parts. Is this allowed, number one? And number two, what are cryptos? What's a cryptocurrency exactly? I mean, you can argue that cash and paper money and the, the money that you have in your savings account is basically the same thing because it's not backed by gold in most cases and therefore it's just numbers in a computer program, numbers in a database. So are these two things the same? Are they different? If cryptocurrency is problematic, on what basis is it problematic? So identifying the problem and then applying the rule to that problem. This is a lot harder and a lot more difficult than it seems. It's not that easy. Another example is music. I'm sure, again, one of those questions that I get a lot. Music is haram for the most part. There are exceptions to the rule. Fine. But what is music? Define music to me. And so what scholars do oftentimes is they might use different criteria. There are scriptural references that are important for this discussion. So for instance, they might say musical instruments are used, but what about synthetic, synthesized music? Music that's produced in a computer program, right? Or if you record certain sounds from natural sources and uh, code the, the keys on a, on a piano to play those sounds, but then you play them in such a sequence that they produce music. Is that considered music if no musical instruments are used? You see where I'm coming from? The idea here is we need to define what music is before we figure out whether music is permissible or not, right? Then you have different components to what we call music today. So there is the vocals, then there is the lyrics, so the content, the actual poetry, if we could call it that, and you also have the issue of whether or not this is considered haram or halal. 
Sometimes the scholars like Ayatollah Sayyid al Uthman Sayyid Ali Sistani, may Allah bless him and prolong his life, he says that this is something that's delegated to the community of believers, people who are pious, people who are, uh, are endowed with the intellect, they can decide whether this music is something that is familiar to gatherings of sin. So you can argue that this definition is in itself difficult to define, right? What's a gathering of sin? But again, what happens is that this task of defining the subject is delegated to what's called the urf, what people understand this to mean, right? The same thing applies to water and so many other things, right? We know that you can do wudu only with water and tayammum with soil. Okay, so what's water? H2O is not the water that we drink. There are so many other things in it. Then you have water that you get from your tap and you have water that you get from the sea. I mean, that's salt water. If you drink that, you'll die of dehydration. Is that considered water as well, in spite of the salt content in it, right? And so, what about rose water? Rose water, which is where you get roses and place them in the water, you soak them, and then you take all that, and it, it's got this beautiful fragrance that's added as an ingredient to all kinds of food. Is that considered water? And so what the scholars say is, look, in this case, because we have a hadith, and obviously the verses of the Quran that say that you should use water to perform wudu, therefore anything that's called water, anything that's called ma, is, some, is, is a substance that you can use to perform wudu. And it's a purifying agent, it, so many rules apply to it. So when you refer to water in the ocean, you don't call it salt water, you just call it water. Therefore, it's acceptable. But when you say rose water, you're adding an adjective, you're adding something to the definition. It's no longer just water in its absolute sense, it's rose water, which means that you can't do wudu with it. In other words, Islam wants some of these definitions to be accepted in the manner that they're understood by the majority of people. So if rose water in 200 years time became the predominant source of nourishment, if all the water in the world or half the water in the world was converted into rose water or some other substance or element uh, was introduced into the equation, that would still, that would then be acceptable to use it because then they wouldn't call it rose water, but water. I know this sounds a bit complicating, but bear with me. So, this, we said the first thing is that the marja has to spend a lifetime of learning and ijtihad, which stems from the word jihad, juhd. This individual has to exert maximum effort, devote every fiber of their being to learning the various disciplines that are either prerequisites or essential to the science of jurisprudence and the extrapolation of rules from their original sources, which by the way, it encompasses no less than six or seven different disciplines, which means that if we were to use this analogy, and I don't like to use it, but to illustrate for people who don't quite grasp the, the, the gravity and the difficulty of ishtihad, a mushtahid would have knowledge that is similar to about six or seven PhDs. Because they're not just specializing in one field, in one discipline, but rather in a wide variety of disciplines at the highest level. Starting with language and ending with fiqh and usul. So it's a very rigorous and difficult process. Then we said the second point is to understand the mawlu'ah, right? To understand the subject matter on which the mawlu'ah, riba, usury, interest. What is interest exactly? With all of these new um, uh, mathematical models and economic uh, opportunities, the things they trade, for instance, on Wall Street and big stock exchanges, the big hedge funds, they engage in action that is truly confusing. And you can't quite tell whether this is considered riba or not. So we know what riba is in terms of the religious definition, the, the textual definition of riba, right? But whether this act, this trade, 
this product is contaminated by riba is a very difficult thing to tell in many cases. And so the scholar has to have that expertise as well. The final component, and this is what I want to focus on tonight, that allows a mushtahid to be a mushtahid, a faqih, a jurist, to be a faqih, is divine backing. What we mean by that is there is this stardust, this magic ingredient, if you like. There is this component without which ishtihad is impossible. The Imams have spoken extensively about this. The Quran speaks about it, in fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, says, وَلَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Surah Al-Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to know the applications and true meanings of these verses, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is privy to that knowledge and those who are deeply vested and invested in knowledge. A rasikh. Rasikh is a structure, a building that's unshakable. In other words, they have to have so much knowledge that suddenly the verses of the Quran begin to relieve begin to uh, reveal themselves, the inner meaning of those verses reveal themselves to this individual. The other verse, because one might say, well, this is basically a reference to those two previous points, which is that they need to invest their time and energy and spend uh, every waking moment of their lives acquiring knowledge from a good, reliable source, right? Or it could mean spending time and effort in trying to, to understand and define the subject on which the rules are applied. But listen to this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah wa Allah. This is a key verse. Allah says, you want to learn, you want to acquire knowledge, you have to begin with taqwa. You have to begin with God consciousness, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But why? If this was a simple process of deduction, then anybody, whether they're pious or not, whether they're Muslim or not, whether they're human or not, they can simply take this knowledge, process it, and arrive at the conclusions that are acceptable and uh, perhaps correct. Why does Allah make piety a condition? Why? Again, it's a reference to the fact that knowledge isn't about simply sitting through classes, revising, researching, learning, memorizing, so that you could reach a conclusion. Which is why Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam The Imam says, that if you seek knowledge, you need to know that knowledge is not about learning. It's a little counterintuitive. You'd think that the way to acquire knowledge is to learn. The Imam says, no, that's only part of the equation. Yes, لا يحوز العلم إلا من يطيل درسه. You can't simply wake up one day and say, I've been pious. I've never studied a day in my life, never set foot in the Islamic seminary, or spent a short stint, maybe a three years or so, back in the 80s, and now I have all the knowledge I need. I'm a mushtahid. You can't do that. Based on the idea that Allah taught me, Allah revealed knowledge to me. The Imam says that the only way to acquire knowledge is to yutilu darsah, is to spend many, many years, a lengthy period of time, Acquiring the knowledge, just like you can't expect to be healed without, without referring to who? The doctor. You need to go through the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you and has made available to you. Then you need to pray so that healing comes. Ya man ismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ultimately the one who gives healing. But you have to go through the process. The famous story of Musa 
ala nabina wa alihi wa alihi salam who was sick allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him why don't you go to the physician and he said i will pray to you remember this is kalimullah he has a direct line with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I can simply ask you, and you're all powerful, you're omnipotent, you're omniscient, you can give me the healing that I seek. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I will give you the healing that you seek, but you have to go to the physician. Allah is too great, too grand, too majestic to do everything himself. He has means and he has agents and he has other things that keep the system going. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or rather in the hadith of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam to Unwan al-Basri, Allahumma salam. He says to him, إِذَا طَلَبْتَ الْعِلْمِ If you seek knowledge, فَاطْلُبْ أَوَّلًا حَقِيقَةَ الْعُبُودِيَةِ First, you need to seek the essence of servitude and slavery. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be a true slave. And a slave is one who is absolutely obedient. One who surrender, surrenders himself or herself to Allah. But I'm seeking knowledge. Can't I just read books? Can't I go to an institution with brilliant minds who can teach me all these skills just like any other vocation? You can become a brilliant doctor, a brilliant architect, a fantastic professional in whatever field that we have today, simply by learning from the best. You accumulate the knowledge and you become just like them. The Imam says, no, that's not enough. He says, first you have to be a slave. Then the Imam says, لَيْسَ الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمُ Knowledge is not acquired through learning. It is a light. It's a light that Allah shines into the heart of whomever He wishes to guide. Not anyone. In other words, for you to have knowledge, you need to have this critical component. Taqwa. As I said in the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهُ Be pious, Allah will teach you. Now, we have narrations where our sixth Imam, for instance, says, اِعْرِفُوا مَنَازِلَ شِيَعَتِنَا عَلَىٰ قَدَرِ رِوَايَتِهِمْ عَنَّا You want to evaluate someone? You want to judge whether a, a specific individual is worthy of teaching, preaching, sitting on the pulpit or not? The Imam says, if you wish to evaluate individuals, see how often they narrate our traditions to you. How often they say, قال الباقر, قال الصادق, قال الرضا, قال الجواد. Now, this is one criteria the Imam provides. Then he elaborates. He says, فَإِنَّا For we, do not consider a faqih, a jurist, a jurist hatta yakuna muhaddatha. Until this person is muhaddath. What does muhaddath mean? Muhaddath means things are revealed to him. In other words, there is a metaphysical, spiritual dimension that we're not thinking of when we try to answer the question, can the religious scholars and the jurists be replaced with fill in the blank, whether it's AI or anything else. We're not taking into account the spiritual dimension. That is a critical component and without it, there is no knowledge. There is information, sure, but not knowledge. Taqwa has to be there. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ Ulama. You want to know who a true scholar is? He is the one who fears Allah. There has to be fear. Which is why Imam al-Hasan al-Askari salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. He says, Man kana min al fuqaha He's trying to lay the groundwork for the period 
of occultation, the time when we have become orphaned and our Imam is inaccessible to us. In order for that to happen, and in the previous nights, in the first 10 days of the month of Muharram, I talked about this from a different angle. I said, why do you think the Imams never wrote any books? Or if they did, it was a one-off, something that's not common to the tradition of the Imams. You'd think that writing a book would have resolved a lot of the disagreements that we have. And there are a number of reasons as to why that is. But part of it is that the Imams wanted to connect us to the scholars. The Imam could have written a risale, at the very least, right? A legal manual that includes all the do's and don'ts. Halal, haram, mustahab. This is what you do when you have doubt about the number of raka'at. This is how you perform ghusl. The Imam could have simply done that. Instead, the Imams delegated the task of ifta' to who? To their companions, to their scholars, to their students, that is. The people who came to the Imams, learned from them, then the Imams would tell them, اذهب يا زرارة إلى مسجد رسول الله واجلس وأفت الناس Go to the mosque of Rasulullah and issue verdicts. Give them decrees, tell them what they're supposed to do. So, حتى يكون محدثة So they asked the Imam, they said to him, what do you mean the jurist receives revelation? or is inspired or given knowledge from a supernatural source. And the Imam said, that's how it is. He is taught mu'allama. He receives ilm. He receives guidance on what to do, what to say, especially when it comes to critical matters. Sayyid Sistani told my father, he said that the night when I was put under a lot of pressure to issue the fatwa against ISIS, what did the Sayyid do? Go to his books and review all the different scriptures and weigh them up and use analogy and deductive jurisprudence. He said, I went to the rooftop and I appealed to Fatima to Zahra. And I get how some people might ridicule this. So what are you talking about? Appeal to Fatima to Zahra, I mean, you could just go and... In fact, you know what the answer is. It's obvious. You hear that a lot. The answer is obvious. Why the confusion? Why the cautious attitude? Why do the scholars often say, احتياط وجوبي, obligatory precaution? We know what the answer is. This is the verse of the Quran, this is the hadith of the Prophet, this is the statement of the Imam, just issue the verdict. Get it over and done with. But that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Our scholars, they understand that number one, their responsibility is a grave one. They exert every effort in refining their soul because they understand that it's not just about the evidence that's presented to you. Sometimes the evidence could be rather clear, but as a jurist, you have to take into account that this is God's religion we're talking about. When a marja says that such act, for instance, is wajib, what he's telling his followers, that those who emulate him, is that this is God's law. They're ascribing this rule to the creator of the universe. And so they have to be extra, 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 extra cautious. Sayyid Hadi al-Milani, one of the great scholars, who used to be in Najaf, uh, then Karbala, then the holy city of Mashhad. One of my teachers used to attend his classes for a number of years, perhaps nine, 12 years. And he says that for a week, he was teaching a minor peripheral rule, which he didn't mention what it was, but I imagined or I assumed that it was something to do with mustahab or makruh. So not about an obligatory act or something that's forbidden, something very minor. But he kept arguing and making his case both for and against it, which is what they do, 
And by, by the way, one thing a lot of people don't understand is just what the process looks like. It's incredibly hair splitting. It is so rigorous, so deep, so nuanced, so difficult that for some people to simply dismiss these rules is a grave and gross travesty of justice. Again, we don't understand what they go through. One of the classes I was attending was by a teacher who, when I joined the class, he had been teaching the subject for the previous two years. Then I joined it for one year. So three years of what? Al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar. Imagine three years, day in and day out, enjoining the good and forbidding evil. It's not as simple or as easy as some people think. So when a marja gives you his verdict, it means that years and years of hard work and piety and devotion and supplication have gone into this to simply dismiss it and say these scholars, they don't know what we go through, they don't know our problems, they don't understand the modern world is a gross injustice. So anyway, my teacher says that uh, after a week, the verdict given by Sayyid Hadi al-Milani, Abdul Hadi al-Milani, rahmatullah was uh, a precautionary one. In other words, I'm not sure. I don't know. Do it just in case it happens to be wajib, even though, according to the students, they felt that this was not necessary, right? So one of his students gets up. He says to him, and of course, there's a lot of debate as well that happens. It's, the, it's an incredible, lucid, transparent uh, process where there is a lot of engagement, a lot of discussion. Again, it's not just some guru sitting on a podium and issuing decrees. So he said to him, Sayyidana, <laughs> we know the answer is this. Why are you taking a precautionary route? It's obvious, it's clear. So my teacher says that the Sayyid put his head down for a while. Then he raised his head and he said, look, my neck isn't thick enough to become a bridge for people on the day of judgment. I don't want to burden myself with the actions of believers knowing that I don't have 100% certainty. If your neck is thick enough, fine, you can issue the fatwa. I won't do it myself. And that is a key difference between, say, a high court or a Supreme Court judge and a jurist. A jurist has to take into account the fact that he's dealing with the single most delicate task in the entire world, which is to elaborate and elucidate the religion of God. It's not just a matter of taking the constitution or laws passed by parliament to apply the law in specific circumstances. It's much more difficult than that. Which is why one of the maraja used to say that a mujtahid spends 20 years teaching dars al-kharij. So this is after the muqaddimat and sutuh al-uliya and all those things. So add another 10 years to that. 30 years of hard work and labor. And then when he wants to issue a fatwa, his hand still shakes. He's still afraid. It's like, am I doing the right thing or not? Is this truly the verdict that I have no reasonable doubt about? And so what this requires is a lot of piety. An AI model can't provide that. An AI model can't receive divine backing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can't receive true knowledge. It simply uses the information that's available to it with all of the biases and all of the other issues, because some people say an AI model doesn't have any biases, right? Others have said, well, how about we have like a collective system where it's a number of people, not just one. Again, you'd think that with a number of people, you've addressed the bias issue. You haven't. You've merely replaced one problem with another. In fact, if anything, you've amplified the problem. Instead of one individual with biases, you now have five or six. How did you solve the problem? You need taqwa. You need to fear Allah. Listen to what our sixth Imam says to Zurara. And this is a key point as well. He says to him, Ya Zurara, Khudh bima ishtahara bayna ashabik. If you see two reports, two hadiths, two verdicts, two fatwas, right? And they 
appear to you as being equally legitimate, equally acceptable, equally grounded in evidence, but one conforms with and is aligned with the consensus of Shia, take that and leave out the other one. So just because you think that you've made some pioneering, trailblazing discovery that no one's ever discovered before, doesn't mean that you should issue a fatwa based on that. Every marja, every scholar, every jurist for the last 12 centuries says that dogs are najis, that they cannot be bought or sold unless they're used for the purpose of being a guard dog or to help a shepherd or something along those lines which have been specifically stipulated in our traditions. But oh no, I have to set myself apart. I have to uh, come up with something that's, you know, antithetical to the norm. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. Fasting of the day of Ashura. Again, every Shia since the times of the Imams knew and understood that fasting in Islam, if it's recommended, other than the obligatory, obviously, in the holy month of Ramadan, but other than that, you would fast to celebrate. Fasting was a means of showing gratitude to Allah, which is why Bani Umayyah insisted that the day of Ashura and the day of Tasu'a should be observed as days of, of fasting. It's obvious, but no, I have to set myself apart. Fasting? We have a number of hadith here and there. The Imams have told us that if you see two, diff two contradictory ahadith about a subject matter, accept the one that contradicts the other camp. Because there might be cases where we're forced to say things. We're forced to uh, provide verdicts on matters that we have no choice about. So when we encounter an example like this, which of these ahadith do we take? We take the one that contradicts the Bani Umayyah and their scholars and their jurists. But then the verdict you get is, yeah, as long as you fast without the intention of celebrating, but simply to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's fine. Well, you could say the same thing about having a wedding on the day of Ashura, can't you? I could have a wedding on the day of Ashura, not for the purpose of celebrating the death of Imam al Hussein, but simply because I want to get married today. Leave out the other 364 days of the year, choose the day of Ashura to get married, hold a wedding. As long as the intention is right, you're good. Says who? Now you're gonna fast on the day of Ashura, next thing you know we're gonna have weddings. Next thing you know we're gonna have vacations. In fact, we could do literally whatever we want, as long as the intention is right. They fasted on the day of Ashura to celebrate the killing of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, the flesh and blood of Rasulullah. My point is, the Imams have provided us with guidelines. Back to the hadith of the Imam to Zurara. He said to him, Ya Zurara, Khudh bima ishtahara bayna ashabik. If you see a group of, of uh, scholars, right, jurists, they've all followed this particular rule. And you don't even know. You don't know what the origin of it was. Maybe there was a hadith back in the time of Shaykh al-Saduq, al-Tusi, al-Mufid, what have you, that's now been lost. I mean, we know for a fact that hundreds of thousands of manuscripts were burnt and destroyed. But the fact that scholars have followed this rule from that day to this day, shouldn't that be reason for you to be cautious? And not simply rush to issuing a verdict without taking into account that there is consensus on this, or if not a consensus, the majority of scholars follow this. Sahib al Hadaiq, a Sheikh Yusuf al Bahrani, Allah Ta'ala Ali, he was a, an Akhbari, although you could argue that he was a moderate Akhbari, but he was an Akhbari that was taken very seriously by Usuli scholars. Al-Muhaqqiq Sayyid Al-Khu'i Rahmatullah would issue his fatwas by taking into consideration the verdicts of Shaykh Yusuf Al-Bahrani. That's how seriously he was taken. Sahib Al-Hadaiq says in a discussion 
that has to do with a particular uh, fiqhi ruling, he says that there are those who don't take into account the mashhur. That's mashhur meaning the thing that has the majority of scholars supporting it. He simply goes by, you know, it's a, it's a 2 plus 2 equals 4 kind of equation for them. This is the verse, this is the hadith, we put them together, we issue a verdict. He said, those who do this and dismiss the consensus of scholars or the majority opinion of scholars, they can't be taken seriously. If 95% of physicians that you visit for a critical matter, like, I don't know, brain surgery, they all tell you one thing, and then this random physician comes and tells you that, no, you shouldn't use that treatment. You, in fact, you don't even need surgery. Just take this pill and you'll be good. Would you take that person seriously? Any reasonable mind, any intellect will say, hang on a second. He may have a good argument to make. He may have presented evidence to support his case, but I can't dismiss all those other people because this is a critical matter. And what's more critical than religion? What's more critical than that? The Imam then says to Zurara, he says to him, nadir. Leave the things that are rare. In other words, an opinion that almost nobody else subscribes to. The Imam says, leave that alone. Don't follow it. See what the majority of your companions, meaning the jurists of the time, see what they say, follow that. The Imam then says that you will find guidance through that. In other words, that's closer to the truth. That's a more valid opinion. In another hadith, the Imam says to one of his companions, possibly uh, Abu Basir, he says to him that لا تأخذن معالم دينك إلا من عند شيعتنا Take the broad guidelines, the fundamental tenets. Take your religion. From who? Do not take them from anybody else except our followers. Why? If it's just information that's being processed to arrive at a conclusion, why does the person have to be a Shia? Why? This whole idea that, yeah, when it comes to having an open heart surgery, I will go to the Hindu and the Buddhist and the Jewish and the Christian, but when it comes to moon sighting, I have to, the person has to be Adil. The Imam is saying this. The Imam says that there is a big difference. Here you're dealing with religion. لا تأخذن with ta'kid. معالم دينك إلا من عند شيعتنا. If it was just a matter of processing the information, you wouldn't need to go to the Shia. Go to anybody. It could be an atheist who becomes a mushtahid. Can't he? An atheist goes to the Islamic seminary, spends 30 years, comes back, having read all the books, studied all of the disciplines, and now gives you his verdict, the opinion. Can you take it? No. Why? Because the Imam says that if you do so, فَقَدْ أَخَذْتَ الْأَمَانَةَ مِنَ الْخَائِنَ You have taken the trust from someone who has betrayed the trust. Which trust? What if that person is being genuine and sincere and doesn't have any you know, ulterior motives. Can't we have that? The Imam says, they have betrayed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their beliefs. They've betrayed Allah. If someone betrays my brother, would I go and partner with him in business? What if someone betrays God and the Prophet? Would I go and take my religion from them? The Imam says, you can't do that. In addition to that, and I'll conclude with this, how do we know al-masalih wal mafasid as they say? The problem with, with people who try to take a shortcut when it comes to ishtihad and issuing religious verdicts is once again, it's a very reductionist kind of view of ishtihad. They think of it as just a mathematical equation, which as we illustrated, it is not. That's only part of the picture. And the other problem is that they assume or claim that they know the purpose for each ruling. So they'll tell you, we know the purpose of, for instance, zakat 
is to have money deducted from your income and spent on those who are poor. That's the essence of the law. You'll often hear these things, these kinds of expressions. The spirit of the law is what matters, not the letter of the law. The Quran says this and that, that doesn't matter. Let's find out what the spirit is. Let's find out what the, some kind of esoteric inner meaning that they've come up with themselves, which allows them to dismiss clear injunctions and prohibitions, verses in the Quran, hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt, throw all those out because it's the essence, it's the spirit that matters. Basically disemboweling religion and reducing it to the very bare bones minimum. That's the idea. They call it dine hadda aqalli, right? Minimalist religion. Don't bother with all those extra bells and whistles. Don't bother with salat and siyam. Salat is what? Salat is you focusing your attention on God and being thankful and grateful to Him. So just do yoga every morning and you're done, right? Th these are discussions that are being made in a very serious way now. And you see the danger of all of this, where this could lead us in 10, 20 years time. It disembowels religion. It allows them to pick and choose from the Quran a la carte, right? Based on whatever's trending at the time, based on what, whatever's popular, based on what people love to hear from me. Because at the end of the day, if I make people like me, if I say things that are music to their ears, no pun intended, this will make me popular, strengthen and bolster my position. There is money involved, there is authority, there is uh, you know, power and running the institutions, right? It's very appealing. And so just tell people whatever they want to hear. This is nothing new. This has been around since the time of Prophet Adam <laughs> Every prophet, the biggest problem that prophets faced was what? That they came and challenged the norms of the societies they were sent to. They came to tell people, you're wrong. They came to pay, make people uncomfortable. Because God says one thing and what you're doing is the exact opposite, it's wrong. Prophets weren't there to make friends. As Imam Al-Kadham says to Harun, you've heard the hadith when Harun said to the Imam, you know, now that I've become the king, come and see me. Pay us a visit, right? We'll look after you, we'll take care of you. We might even give you some money like we do with everybody else. And the Imam said to him, Man arada dunya. Excuse me, the Imam said to him that I, uh, why would I come? He said that you can come and advise us. You know, you could be my advisor. I mean, imagine the president or the prime minister or some high ranking authority says to an otherwise ordinary, unemployed, so-called scholar, that we'd like you to become the advisor to the prime minister's office or the president's office. Who would say no? Only the most pious. The imam said to him that whoever, uh, I won't come to you because you haven't received anything that we would celebrate you for. We would congratulate you for, right? In other words, why should I come to you? You think now that you're the Khalifa, right? People should come and congratulate you, but it's not a blessing that we should congratulate you for this. And you don't see it as a tragedy so that you would accept my condolences. In other words, it's a tragedy. The fact that you're in this position means that you're going to dig your, your own grave with your own hands. You're gonna commit so many more sins than you were just an ordinary human being. So then he says to the Imam, come and advise me, help me out. The Imam said to him, Man arada dunya la yansahuk, wa man arada al-akhirata la yashabuk. The one who seeks the akhira will never be in your company because you're not going to help him seek the akhira. And whoever wants the dunya is not going to advise you. Right? You're a bunch of yes men, right? nodders. Yeah, yeah, mashallah, beautiful. A multi billionaire once said this to me. He said that billionaires and people who are in positions of authority, they think they're the smartest, most brilliant people anywhere in the world. And the reason for that is because we're surrounded by yes men. Whatever I say, my own employees, they're like, yeah, brilliant, absolutely, whoa. 
He himself was admitting to this. He's like, after a while, it gets to your head. And you think that everything that rolls down your tongue is a word of wisdom. When in fact it's not. Oftentimes they're the dumbest people. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give them rizq to test them, just like he takes away rizq from the poor to test them. That's the whole thing. So we don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's objective is. We don't know what he is trying to achieve. For us to make assumptions about that is nothing but pure speculation. And so these kinds of people will always fall into what? Analogy. They'll always insert their own biases and opinions and whatnot in order to achieve what they desire to achieve. There are lots of discussions pertaining to this. Maybe we'll have the chance to talk more. But the key point here is this. Nothing can replace the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Prophet and the Imams have created for us. The one that is best elucidated in the words of our 11th Imam when he says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ صَائِنًا لِنَفْسِهِ حَافِظًا لِدِينِهِ مُخَالِفًا عَلَى هَوَاهِ مُطِيعًا لِأَمْرِ مَوْلَاهِ فَلِلْعَوَامِ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوهِ If a jurist is found who defies his own desires, who obeys his master, even if it's irrational to him, even if it contradicts his logic, that's the very meaning of Islam. If you're looking for the essence of the faith, if you're looking for the core of Islam, it is what? Submission, surrender. It doesn't make sense, I don't care. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me. If you find a scholar like that, the Imam says, people can then take him as a source of emulation, follow him. The Imam then adds the following, listen carefully to this. He says, وَذَلِكَ لَا يَكُونُ لِجَمِيعِ فُقَهَاءِ الشِّيَعَةِ and this doesn't apply to every jurist of the Shia. In other words, they've satisfied the condition of being Shia, they've satisfied the condition of being a jurist, they've put in all the work. Yet the Imam says that this doesn't apply to just about anyone. Someone could be a quote-unquote mushtahid, meaning they have a certificate from someone that does not qualify them to become sources of emulation and to issue verdicts. That's why you go to those who are tried and tested. That's why you refer to people whose disinterest in the pleasures of this world have been demonstrated for decades on end. You go to people who don't take money from others, who live lives of austerity just like our supreme maraja. You go to people who exhibit humility and are not interested in degrees and certificates and titles and positions of authority of any kind. They're the ones you follow.